next panel, Multimodal Mobility, the Digital Fix for a Connected Tomorrow. We're being joined by leaders that are paving the way for innovations in this space and basically revolutionizing the way we move and travel. Please join me in welcoming Lucky. Where are you, Lucky? You're Lucky. Lucky Larika, he's Vice President and Head of Digital Services at Ericsson Middle East and Africa. Harjda Liwal is the Managing Director for the Middle East and India at Virgin Hyperloop, another revolutionizing idea for mobility. Jaideep Danoa is the co-founder and CEO of Phoenix. And you're ready, you're all mic'd up. <laughs> you're already ready to go. Have a seat, please. Hassan Al-Husseini is the CEO of Bayanat. And your moderator will be um, Patrick Noah. But before that, I'd like to welcome one more speaker, who's Teddy Sabah, the managing director of Nissan Middle East. Welcome, Teddy. All right, we'll get a uh, mic over to you, Terry. Terry, French, very French. Terry, with an R. Bon. Okay, we can do that. We'll get a mic to Terry as I welcome our moderator, who will be Patrick Noah, Executive Director for the Dubai Future Foundation. It's nice to be here in person and it's nice to have such a lovely panel. Thank you for the introductions. You've saved us a little bit of time because I'm speaking fast as we have uh, a slight overrun so we need to compress the time we have on stage but you can equally speak uh, uh, fast to do that. Now we're here to speak about multimodal mobility which is quite a tongue twist and, and, and alliteration so it's really about practicing saying that right, multimodal multi mobility. But I think the important point here is that with mobility, with the way mobility is going, it's really about practicing it. It's about rehearsing the future. It's, it's about understanding where the technologies that we are developing right now may be going in years to come. Thinking back, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of some of the pictures that um, technologists and artists have developed on the future of mobility, Back in the 1800s, you can see those uh, hot air balloons and you can see those flying galleons all powered by things like, like oars and geese that pull these machines forward. And so those were the ideas and those were the aspirations of mobility and travel and moving goods and people uh, of the future with AI on 1880. Now, of course, this has all changed absolutely massively. So it's not exactly a new solution or a new, dis new conversation, but the, the point at which we are in terms of technology and in terms of also the knowledge we have of how disruptive and emerging technologies can have an effect on different kinds of fields is absolutely immense. It's also, I think, incredibly um, current and, and relevant to have these conversations in, at Expo and in Dubai, which is really about ensuring that cities become smart, that they're future ready, and they're, that they're fully integrated. Um, and so with panelists right now, today, we're examining how disruption, technology, and all things digital enable the transition towards what I think is integrated, better, faster, cheaper, and hopefully greener movement of people, goods, and services. So this is all incredibly relevant, and I can not think of a better panel to have these discussions right now. So I'm going to go through a handful of rounds, uh, because there are, there are questions I want to uh, address from a, a number of different uh, perspectives. So I want to start with, uh, with Harj, simply because you here have the biggest piece of kit, uh, Hyperloop. Um, testing has, has, has been done. When are we going to be able to board one of these things, and what might stand in the way of that? 
fantastic question. Um, yeah, we, we, we do have a big piece of kit, but I suppose, you know, we, we came to the Middle East in 2017, so it's not as if we're, we're, we're new here. And the company was founded in 2014, and, and still to date, I consider ourselves as a, as a startup organization. Um, but, you know, since 2014 to 2021, I think the one thing that we've done, above all, is captured everyone's imagination. And that's the ability to be able to move differently. You know, when we consider right back, you know, into the 18th century, you know, we've been relying on trains, planes, automobiles, and shipping now for nearly 150 years, right? And when we consider man's endeavor to be able to now go backwards and forwards to the moon, to be able to have vehicles that drive on their own, yeah? We are still relying on old constructs to be able to almost address 21st century solution or issues, yeah? So, you know, we, we, we embarked and we, found it, we were founded in a garage and, and the whole principle, for those of you who don't uh, know too much, but you know, the whole principle started back in 2013 with Elon Musk, uh, who was stuck in a traffic jam just outside San Francisco and decided that there must be better ways of traveling around than sitting on a six lane highway polluting the earth. So he came up with the, 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 the term hyperloop at that time and decided that, you know, if we actually just remove the air and it's, 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 it's an interesting concept because all we do on Earth is shift air. Moving your arm around now, moving around this stage, all we're doing is moving air. You only have to put your arm outside when you're traveling in a car to understand how much of a resistance air gives and how much energy you need to actually overcome it. So, you know, by just removing the air, all of a sudden you've now created a new form of transport that requires a little energy. So we as a company, we've been working diligently at that. You know, we have over 300 people. We're based in Los Angeles. Um, and our test site is just outside uh, Las Vegas. And we're the only organization that actually has a full-scale test facility. And since 2017, we've conducted over 500 full-scale tests, which culminated in us actually taking our first passengers in a Hyperloop back in November 2020. So I think that was a real milestone because two questions I get asked all the time. One, has anybody been on it? Two, is it safe? And I think the testing that we did the back end of last year proved a, uh, a, a big yes to both of those. So there's two aspects that we're really working on. One is continuing to drive technology because the one other concept, one other way of looking at it, I was talking to the panelists earlier on, I wonder how much of the audience understand that actually what we're developing is actually an electric vehicle. All our vehicles are now battery operated, right? They're in a low pressure environment, battery operated. But the point is, for the first time, we're developing a system that is actually putting the passenger at the heart of the system. And when we consider all of the transport modes that came before, they were driven out of necessity. You know, the Victorians were fantastic. You know, innovation is amazing. And innovation, I'm a true believer, only comes through necessity. And you know, the Victorians, in a hundred year period between 1804 and 1904, gave us the modes of transport that we use today. We've never changed them since then. But what they did do is not do it for passenger use, they did it for cargo. They did it for actually being able to feed the factories that were churning out and manufacturing goods that the world was needing at the time of the first industrial revolution. So it was driven out of necessity, and, and I think we're at a real crossroads right now that we are at a crossroads where I think innovation will need to actually come back to the fore to actually address some of the 21st century issues that we're facing today. Excellent. Can I, in, on that, can I jump to you, um, Jaideep, and in case you're wondering, Jaideep is with Phoenix, it says so on his hat too. Um, it's really about moving individuals, right? The one person. This is a very single user solution, but it's also potentially a solution for moving small amounts of goods. So can you tell us a little bit about, about your solution and how you're going to, or planning to disrupt the way things are done at the present here? Yeah. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, so, big picture, I mean, the themes of Expo as well, right? Mobility, opportunity, sustainability, they're what Phoenix are all about, right? Uh, like mobility, people are moving because they want to get somewhere, right? They want to get to work, they want to get to school, 
I'm going to get home to take care of the family, right? Um, and there's a cost to moving, right? And it's a tax. It's a tax on what you can do in your world, and it's a tax on what we can do as cities. So at Phoenix, our mission is to unleash urban potential and propel communities forward. We want to reduce this tax, which is a regressive tax, where the less you make, the more you pay in share of income and, and in time, right? Uh, and uh, the way to uh, make it more affordable and accessible for everyone requires actually a change in the overall structure and how we move. Mm -hmm. right? Most of our uh, mobility needs today in, uh, is in cities. 70% mm -hmm. of those trips are actually one passenger. Right? And yet, we're servicing most of those trips with a 2,000 kg vehicle, right? or even 4,000 kgs if it's electric. Right? Um, so you can see like all of that cost is actually going to move the car, not to move you. Right? Uh, and that cost is not just for you, it's also the cost that we bear as a society. The infrastructure cost that we have to pay, the space that we allocate, the pollution, not just global warming, local pollution, local air pollution, local noise pollution. Right? And so with Phoenix, we're like, let's focus on this primary predominant use case and let's offer actually a portfolio of products to service it. So we offer shared e-scooters, right? And like our team, uh, we pioneered that service here in the Middle East with our last company. We offer uh, another business model, which is a private subscription service. We call it My Phoenix, uh, where you can get, it's like Netflix for scooters. We, we deliver a scooter to your house. You pay a flat monthly fee, 150 dirhams, or like five dirhams a day for unlimited rides with uh, insurance and maintenance and a smart app and can pause or cancel any time. And we're introducing other uh, form factors as well. E-bikes, mopeds, maybe even our own version of pods. <laughs> Someday. And um, the idea is by having this portfolio, you're giving choice to the market, right? Uh, where you can address all the different consumer segments, use cases, price points and environments in our cities, right? And we started, of course, with passenger mobility, and uh, uh, that's the primary emphasis, but recently we also got into, you can call it e-commerce, right? Which is also growing rapidly and is adding to the congestion uh, in our cities, right? So we are now doing a service called F10, where we deliver products, convenience items, in less than 10 minutes, right? So imagine, all the freedom and flexibility you now have as a consumer when you have a supermarket on demand in your kitchen. Right? It's almost instant. Mm -hmm. And actually, we do it in seven. Right? Um, so it's been very, very popular and actually very liberating for, for consumers that are now getting a new uh, level of service. Can I just jump on to um, uh, uh, Thierry, uh, who is Managing Director of uh, Nissan here in the Middle East. One of the things that you have just mentioned here is uh, the environment, bearing the environmental costs. Um, and so I wanted to pose the question to Nissan that increasingly consumers are demanding electrified or electrical vehicles. Um, so how are you addressing those demands and how are you also ensuring that from the point of view of, of regulation and gov government responsiveness, you are on par with expectations and also market demands? Yeah, uh, first, uh, it's great to be here today, uh, in particular at the Expo, because we are uh, one of the official automotive, we are the official automotive partner for Expo. And uh, the, the three pillars of Expo when it comes to sustainability, mobility, and opportunity, uh, this is really at the forefront of our strategy. And this is something is really interesting that we are able to bring our global expertise and uh, mix it with our heritage in the region to be able to bring forward uh, our innovation. And uh, electrification is definitely uh, at the forefront of it. So if we go back and see where Nissan, uh, back in the 1950s, we had introduced the first electric vehicles at that time called Tama. Uh, and it was really uh, to show uh, that Nissan is an innovative organization and company and always looking uh, forward uh, there. So, and th last week we also had the opportunity to come here and present and showcase for the first time uh, our electric vehicle, which is a all new uh, electric from scratch 
uh, that is the Aria V. And this is to show uh, that Nissan uh, first uh, has made major announcements over the last uh, few months. One is that they want to become uh, carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, fortunately also the UAE has made the same announcement uh, over the last couple of weeks. So that shows that uh, I think we are thinking uh, alike. And uh, for Nissan is to do that is not just about its product. It's about the entire operation. So there was also some announcement making like when we announced that Nissan Intelligent Factory, it's also making sure that as we build and put into the production systems, uh, zero emissions. Uh, so these are all of the initiatives that Nissan is taking forward. Now, uh, the strategy we have is we are definitely uh, working with governments across the globe. One is to ensure on how we are able to quickly adapt to the regulation change and how we are able to work with the governments to ensure that we have the right regulations. Because we know that uh, on one side, in certain markets, there is a big demand and shift toward, uh, towards electrification. And, but this is not applicable across all countries. So uh, on one side, it's important that uh, all our operations, products, the strategies that we are putting forward are able to adapt to those regulations. On the other side is how we are able to also work with either private companies or uh, governments, NGOs, to how to educate consumers about the benefits of electri electrifications. So uh, this is something that uh, it's an ecosystem that we have to really adapt to. Uh, so we have uh, definitely uh, on one side, uh, we have made certain commitments that in certain key markets uh, by 2030, most or all of our new vehicles will be electrified. Uh, and uh, also uh, in other markets, as the infrastructures allows it, so you take for instance in this part of the world, we have seen that UAE, Saudi, Qatar are trying to push forward uh, in terms of the electrification of vehicles or uh, to lower the emissions. So we are trying to work with hand to make sure that we use our partners, we also use the infrastructures that are available to be able to introduce uh, such products. Because on one side there is still a demand for uh, normal uh, combustion engines, but also the increase uh, of demand in electrification. So uh, we are trying to do that and approach it at different levels, not only from product standpoints, but also in terms of our participation on uh, changing or helping to change the regulations or be engaged uh, in those uh, decisions, uh, but also to make sure that the entire uh, oversee of our operations is adapting to that. That's, that's excellent to hear. And it's, so the way, the way I've been um, trying to, to uh, lead this conversation is to go from big kit, small kit, medium-sized kit, but one of the trends is not just electric vehicles, is also vehicle autonomy, right? self-driving vehicles. We expect a lot more of the cars, not just today, but certainly of the future. Um, and so that is a transition that, that is happening, is going on. It requires a lot of data, data integration, analytics, and also um, ensuring that the right data de reaches the right points at the right time. So can I, before I get to uh, Lucky, can I ask um, Hassan, um, who's CEO at Bayanat, uh, just recently acquired by uh, G42. Um, it was recently announced that uh, Bayanat, a partnership with DMT and ITC, will begin a trial of autonomous vehicles in Abu Dhabi. Exciting news. Can you tell us a little bit more yes, about that, please? Uh, indeed, it's very exciting. Uh, it's a three-phase program that we put on an acceleration program. We're, uh, we've, uh, we're starting, uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we will be launching our uh, first phase, which consists of five cars. Three of them are electric vehicles from Nissan, another two hybrid vehicles. Uh, it will be uh, set for full autonomy at level three, which requires um, a safety officer uh, uh, present within the car. It's gonna be set up in Yas Island uh, uh, going from different points of interest for pickup and delivery and of course it has a full uh, spectrum of applications behind it for ordering. I believe she mentioned Uber and Karim previously so it will have that uh, transportation app uh, behind it to order 
to, to, to have that full operating model. So this is the first phase. The second phase will be more to, uh, going into expanding the fleet uh, uh, quantity-wise and also expanding our uh, geography into different regions of Abu Dhabi. And in parallel, we're looking at moving from L3, where the safety officer is required within the car, into uh, a full autonomy at L4, which does not require a safety officer present for uh, safety and regulation, uh, transportation regulations. The third phase is to move it beyond the robo-taxi program, or uh, just being taxi, moving into uh, public transportation, so minibuses and buses, and also uh, touching uh, base with uh, the industrial uh, arm, so uh, autonomous trucks, uh, autonomous uh, uh, vehicles within uh, industrial areas and ports and so forth. So this is the comprehensive program. We put it into an accelerated program. We're trying to push it all to be, to be as fast as possible. Hopefully, by the end of 2022, we will be uh, deploying our third phase. That's the program that we have uh, currently within uh, Bayanat. Bayanat is very much a um, satellite and uh, data integration, so satellite data integration company. Uh, it's actually more than that. So uh, the classical Bayanat uh, uh, does all the mapping and surveying. So we go from underground surveying into uh, geo, uh, uh, geo, uh, geo surveying, ground surveying, hydro surveying, aerial surveying through planes. Uh, currently, we are also exploring the stratosphere and to, uh, uh, to put that into this, the picture, all the way to downstream uh, remote sensing from, from satellites. So this is the surveying principle. And uh, when the G42 acquired Bainat, our mandate was to uh, implement a disruptive approach towards the classical mapping and surveying principle, towards a more uh, geo-AI principle, uh, adding that AI layer and seeing how uh, smart positioning and smart georeferencing may uh, serve the other different uh, verticals, uh, whether it's mobility or uh, uh, mobility on the ground, mobility in the air, and so forth. So the program has started since last year, and we are going through a very exciting uh, but uh, also painful transformation period right now, uh, and it's very um, uh, uh, open into different spectrums from uh, uh, from uh, geo uh, 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 geo surveying into geo intelligence into intelligent mobility. Lucky, over to you. Right now, we are in this space where things, Internet of Things, are coming together, where data streams need to be flowing, as I said earlier, yes. to the right places at the right times. Uh, in the right ways. Can you tell us a little bit more what Ericsson is doing to promote that here in the region for autonomous vehicles, but also perhaps other offerings that people might be able to uh, utilize in years to come through the wireless technologies that, you're, that, you're, that you have? Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting the way that you steered the conversation. Big kit, small kit, automated vehicles, autonomous vehicles. Imagine trying to build a network that you can actually connect these things yeah. together. Yeah. Um, we call that Imagine Possible, and that's our mantra at Ericsson. And for us, the whole driver is a platform for innovation, and that's the 5G network. And that's something that we're working with all of our service providers across the globe, especially here in the Middle East and Africa, to drive networks that are not only great for the mobile broadband consumer, but that allow for industries to innovate, industries to digitize, and industries to transform what we thought we couldn't do. And that's something that, um, you know, we've been driving, you, you talked about autonomous vehicles, we've been driving a lot um, with various partners. It is an ecosystem play. And for us, we're working with our service providers to realize that dream. For us at Ericsson, we're obviously investing in uh, connected vehicles, we're doing cloud platforms that are able to connect vehicles together. Today we have five and a half million vehicles connected, cloud-based platform, together with partner systems um, that we operate and give them an in-vehicle experience, um, together with automotive industries. We're working, collaborating with the 5G Automotive Association to help set the global standards and benchmarks around security, connectivity, privacy, um, how do you roam 
across borders with these type of vehicles. So we're doing a lot to set the groundworks of how service providers can build a connectivity layer that allows all of this kit, all of the connectivity from uh, IoT sensors, from autonomous vehicles, automated vehicles, all of that to transform how we move about, like the notion of the shifting air about. Um, but we're about you know, shifting data, and it's that processing of data that really becomes invaluable as we try to, uh, again, gain efficiencies not only um, in our operations, the way that we run our networks, but the way that we offer services and offer mobility to each of our industries as well. Yeah. I, I know we're slightly running out of time, and I do want to leave a couple of minutes for questions from the, from the floor. I think one of the really massively important areas that you have touched on but we haven't fully discussed, and this is an open question to anyone, is this is a lot of new technology, a lot of new ways of moving people and goods. How do we ensure that this is 100% safe always? Yeah? So you, you've, got a, you've got people on your scooters, you've got people in, in a hyperloop, you've got people in cars, and you have to somehow integrate that. How do we make sure that you can provide the certainty that it's always safe? Well, I might start, because I'll start at the infrastructure layer. So I do think it is about being able to connect all of the uh, sensors, all of the satellites, all of the uh, data that gets passed around. Um, it is about securing that uh, vehicles or what you call data centers on wheels, um, if I can term it that way. It is about securing that they can not only process data within the vehicle or machine itself, but they can read data from different data sources. That's where we leverage the 5G network to be able to do that in almost real time. Um, so for us, that's one layer of securing that we, with 5G networks, we're running these networks that give the data uh, throughput, the high data throughputs that need to be processed, and the low latency to be able to engage and allow for critical IoT, real time uh, data transfer to secure that safety, to secure that the, the data is being passed around. But it would be interesting to see from a, a key perspective how we secure safety. Your yeah. thoughts, Thierry? Yeah, I, I think uh, from our side, safety is at the top of uh, basically our priorities. And uh, for us, it's not just to build and bring uh, technology that offers the highest uh, levels of safety. It's to have to make it affordable to everyone around. And this is really at the core of our DNA is how to bring innovation, technology, uh, make vehicles more safe, uh, more green, uh, more intuitive, but also democratize that technology and make it available to everyone uh, that uh, is really looking for it. And, and this is something that we are really uh, focusing on. And today when you look at uh, what is uh, Nissan intelligent mobility, it's all about intelligent driving, intelligent power, intelligent integration. And most of the, uh, today, the technology we have in our vehicles is offering that. So you take, for instance, now, one of the latest technology we have is ProPilot. And it's a, it's a really assistance cruise control to make sure that it helps the, the, the driver to feel safer and to feel more uh, in control of, of his vehicle. So this is something that is really uh, we are working uh, and uh, it's always important as we do that is to make sure that that technology is affordable and available to everyone. Great. Pradeep, I'll give you the last word on this. If you have, you put people on, on little rickety things, so to speak, um, and they zoom down at high speed through traffic. How do you make that safe? Yeah, I was wondering whether I should bite my tongue or be a little controversial with my peer group. I did, uh, the, my humble opinion is uh, you know, the biggest uh, safety risk that we have today right, uh, in our streets is the car because it is driven by humans and there's gonna be human error and it's a high speed, high momentum vehicle that kills people, on millions of people every year. Right, and we need to move away from this uh, 
preconceived notion that you know, the car has a monopoly on mobility in our cities. We actually need to embrace multimodality, right? public transit, walking, biking, micromobility, et cetera. It should be a multimodal network. And you know, of course, trying to move the most people in our cities, not the most cars, and do it safely. Right? Uh, that's just the physics of micromobility. You know, means that it's inherently a lot safer. It's low speed, low mass, that means it's low momentum, right? Uh, now your question is like, oh, what if someone rides like on the street, right? Yeah, we need to make space for these vehicles so that you know, they can ride without being scared that someone's gonna hit them in a car, right? The risk is not someone riding a scooter is gonna run over someone and kill them. The risk is someone driving a car is not gonna pay attention and hit the scooter rider, right? Uh, and uh, this is the, the you know, What's exciting about autonomy, right? Uh, of course, you can you know unleash like some more flexibility because now you don't have a, a driver, right? Uh, you can reduce the costs of mobility, but it's also much safer, right? When it comes out, right? But that's a long-term research project, and it's going to take decades to get fully implemented as well. You're talking about replacement cycle of you know millions, hundreds of millions of vehicles around the world, this is a capex spend of like trillions yeah. of dollars, right? Micromobility is ready today, mm -hmm. right? Like, let's not talk about like, you know, 2050, let's talk about 2021, 2022. What can we do today that can help uh, improve people's lives, help improve access to opportunity and emissions and safety and everything else? I mean, it's obvious, we just need to like remove the, the blinds. Excellent. On that note, I can take one or two questions, if there are any. The last few words were really helpful, is improving people's lives, and I think also in, in the process, improving uh, our environment and, and, and ensuring that emissions are within limits. So, are there any questions? I can't see much. If there are, please identify yourselves. If not, um, yes, I have a question here. The gentleman with his raised hand. Can you please let us know who you are ahead of your question? Thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion. My name is Mohammed Rushdie, Fintech Bazaar. Uh, I would like to know, you know, like, uh, you know, innovation and, uh, you know, in this area which you guys all talking about really requires lots of, you know, you know, investment as well as it requires as well the ecosystem to be ready. Uh, Phoenix, for example, or whatever, you know, like you need regulation, you need ecosystem, you need people acceptance as well. It's not really an easy journey. I come from fintech background, but even in the mobility, it's really not easy at all. Uh, so, how do you, you know, you know, overcome this kind of, uh, I would say, difficulty? I think the difficulties bring opportunities as well. Uh, so, how do you, you know, overcome this in your entrepreneurship journey, uh, or for Hyperloop, Bayonet, for whatever? You know, I think we need to hear from you, and then this ecosystem can really, you know, reach to a kind of maturity very soon here in our region. Thank you. If I may, I'd like to answer the question. Yeah, let, me, let me also ask Harj to respond to that because we had an interesting conversation about that and then I'll come back to you as well, Hassan. Can you just, I mean, I didn't catch the question. So can you just repeat that So question? the question is really about, about regulation. How do you ensure that you can get the regulatory environment to the point where all these innovations Perfect. can function? Perfect. It sort of follows on the question that you asked earlier on, okay? So, I mean, I didn't get a chance, but I wanted to come on to this. Um, you know, when you're traveling at 1,080 kilometers an hour, I think safety is absolutely top of our priority. Hmm. Okay, and it can't be done, and I want to be, you know, sure that you would, safety is not just a, a, you know, a single entity's responsibility. It is actually a responsibility between us, the developer, the innovator, the implementer, and also government. And there is a big, big part to play between governments and the industries that we are all talking about here on the stage, from autonomy to hyperloop. So we are working very, very closely with governments right around the world in terms of developing the regulations, the standards, uh, and the processes that we need to enable our technology to be certified to go into public use. So I just want to rest assure everyone from, from our perspective, it is the onus is on us to develop a, a very safe, uh, 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 almost 100% safe system, right? It will be based on a risk-based approach. I mean, we cannot account for every every single eventuality, but it goes back to what you said, Thierry. It, you know, you, you're, you're trying to actually make sure that this is safe, but it needs to be almost on the you know, pragmatic side. And I think if you look at safety, that's always the underlying, what's pragmatic enables to do it. At the same time, there is a bonus and a duty of care on governments to be able to work 
to ensure that they are also satisfied, not just us, they're also satisfied. And that is the process that we're developing. So we're developing those processes in Europe, we're developing those in, in the US, we're developing them here, and we're developing them in India. Ultimately, they'll come together and then that will be certified. No different to the way transport systems, mass transport systems, today are developed, okay? So I think from that aspect, I think you know, we'll get to a point where certification, and by the time we implement, and by the way, you know, we're not talking of implementation, and it goes back to a question you asked earlier on, um, when is it going to happen? Well, you know, our technology is still developing, and it's still going to be about four or five years before we can get to where we are with cargo. And we are going to focus on cargo first. Um, and then we'll move on into the passenger realm. So it is a very structured, graduated process. We use third party safety uh, verifiers that will work with us, and then there's governments and regulators on top. Thank you. Hassan, last word to you. I think I'd like to take it more practical from uh, correlating or balancing between the business perspective and the commercial perspective and the technical perspective. I think that's the pain that he's looking at. And uh, I think there are two key elements here. One is to partner the right uh, governmental entity to build up the proper regulations. If you are into the innovation business, you have to create that kind of regulation. It's not existing. So you have to have the right partner from the government aspect to build with you the regulations, uh, in, uh, of course, with respect to all safety measures and everything. Then from a technical perspective, especially when it comes to autonomy, there are three different phases that we're always building. And it's always put in consideration even from the development phase all the way to the deployment. We deal with three different environments. One is a controlled environment. Two is a semi-controlled environment. And then a non-controlled environment. What do I mean by that? When we say uh, a small uh, uh, test site where the, the car is fully automated and it's moving around a certain path, geofenced, uh, no uh, unpredicted elements into it, that's a controlled environment. Then we take that to the next level. Let's say um, uh, an educational campus, a university campus, or a, a small region, as in our case, Yas Island, right? Then we have a semi-controlled uh, environment where we're dealing with cars, we have that element of unpredictability, but yet we have less pedestrians, we have larger roads, hence the use of autonomy uh, on highways is much easier to implement than actual urban areas. Then when you go to the non-controlled environment, then you have to have all the factors uh, considered into your play. So when you move, of course, considering all the risks, first of all, addressing all these risks, putting the proper mitigation plan step by step on each element, and then it's the interaction. We start by the vehicle itself and its response with its own sensors into vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to environment, uh, vehicle to pedestrian, all the way to V2X. This uh, journey is really essential. And if it's built properly, then from a commercial perspective, it makes sense. From a technical perspective, it makes sense. And of course, the regulation or the authority will be uh, supporting you along the way. All that, across all that element, I think within the third element, and I think this is where Lucky can uh, uh, support me in this, latency is a factor. Mm -hmm. When we move from V to V uh, onto V to X, Absolutely. then that time uh, of, of the data uh, receiving and transferring is really essential. So latency becomes a key factor in that element. And I'll leave it to you to... No, absolutely. To secure that uh, quality of service, um, and, and that's the key ambition, quality of service, because that's what you need to guarantee that data will be transferred, that exactly. sensors will read, that you'll be able to react in a very good way. Exactly. And that's what 5G networks are about. High data throughput, low latency, and the ability to offload data when we need to process it, bring it back. So that, that's the ambition that we have in building these smarter networks. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. This has been, I think, a very, very interesting and, and enlightening ah, early applause and enlightening conversation. Um, I just wanted to spend one, well, half a second to just acknowledge one thing that has that become clear in the conversation here. One is that innovation is really a journey, it's not a destination. It's an ongoing process. And this panel has demonstrated this, I think, amply by having startups next to 
established companies, and they're all innovating. They're all innovating in their own ways, but they no one can do it alone. Everyone is dependent on other systems, and that's why innovation can only happen in a, in a network in a, or, or in an ecosystem. And the better that ecosystem collaborates, talks to one another, and is integrated, the more fruitful that innovation is going to be. Um, let me thank the audience who's here with us in person and also any uh, online visitors to this conference. So thank you very much for making the time. Let me also thank our panelists here, Harj from uh, Virgin Hyperloop, Jadeep from Phoenix, Hassan from Bainat, uh, Lucky from uh, Ericsson, and of course Terry from Nissan. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you.